to the job from here back to here. Now, how quickly it's going to do that, what do you think is going to determine that? Will I can do it immediately or will it take a while to do it? The probability is there, you know. You care very little probability takes the psi, mu, psi, theta. If that number is large, that means this transition is allowed and therefore you can jump here immediately. But if that transition is not allowed, let's say it's got a wrong spin or wrong angular momentum or whatever, there's something that's preventing this molecule from jumping, then what will the molecule do? By some reason, by some method, if you put the molecule up here, <coughs> the molecule will stay there, knowing who you is the ground state down below, it just can't jump down because there's a selection rule preventing it. So it's going to take much longer to do it, to sort of beat that selection rule. In other words, the lifetime of this state is essentially going to be determined by the allowedness of the transition from Highly allowed, lifetime is very short. The molecule doesn't have to live there for long. Because a disallowed transition, it will stay there for a while. Because the selection rules are basically preventing it to jump from the top state to bottom state. If the lifetime is long, what happens? You have, a, you have this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which can be written in various forms, in conjugate theory. And I think conjugate theory is because those are the two uh, uh, properties that are put together. For example, position and momentum. Right? How do you write that? You say that this is a delta x, this is a delta cx. It's a complementary potential. In other words, if I know this, I don't know this. If I know this, I don't know this. I can only get one but not both with equal accuracy. If I'm very accurate, very precise in the determination of my position, I have no business to talk about momentum. And vice versa. Then that was the problem which Frank got into, if you remember, when he was talking about both the position conservation and the kinetic energy conservation in the same breath. But that would be a problem <coughs> as far as the Heisenberg is concerned. There are many such conjugate variables. The total angular momentum and one component. We will learn that at some But for, for us today, we will be looking at a conjugate variable directly into.
In other words, the line is not going to be a sharp line like this. There's going to be a small width associated with that. And where is that width coming from? The width is actually coming from the uncertainty in the energy that the state has to have. Now, quite naturally, the lifetime is very, very short. Like in this case, this spreads up and therefore this line actually opens up. So if you look at a line which is very broad, what's one conclusion that we can immediately make? So it's not a very long length inside the state. And in fact, the lifetime becomes extremely short, like picoseconds or femposeconds. You know, they're really going to get broad. In other words, the width of the line is essentially telling me how quickly the state is decaying. And that is what I meant in the beginning by saying that I get to know about the dynamics of this whole process. Where those two states are is simply what we're solving the Schrodinger equation. And where those two states are tells me where the transition will occur. But how quickly the state decays from upstairs to downstairs actually tells me how wide that line is going to be. Very quick decay, huge uncertainty in the energy, width of the spectrum, very long decay time. You then see that the uncertainty in energy is quite small, you get much sharper lines. And that's basically one of the reasons as to why the line is broad. And this sort of a broadening is what we call as natural broadening.
they just have to spend whatever time that they need to spend and then they get back. But the average time spent by the molecules in the upper state is what we call as a lifetime. Okay. It's got the same meaning as the, in the moment. For example, if you say the lifetime of the population, you say the lifetime of an, of an Indian is let's say 65 years or 70 years or what have you, it does not mean that people die on the 65th birthday. You know? There are some who die early, some who die late, some who pull along for a very long period of time. But then the average is 65. And that's what exactly the same meaning over here. So 10 hours in its lifetime does not mean molecules jump up 10 hours and then come back. It simply means it's an average time spent by the molecule in the excited state. And you've got to keep that in mind because very often this is where the confusion comes. And how do the molecules, if you put 100 of them up there, how do they decay? It's a first order kind of thing. You're studying, or maybe you will study first order kind of thing. Maybe you study it in school. And what is the equation for the first order kind of thing? N equals? You study that. And this exactly follows that. The molecules go up, and then they decay by a first order process. And what is this lambda really? Is the rate constant. I can write the rate constant as 1 over lambda, in which case it's a lifetime. So if t equals tau, which means after one lifetime, how many molecules do I have left? 1 over e of what I have to begin with. And 1 over e of what I have to begin with is how much? 25%. So lifetime essentially tells me. How much time it takes for the population to be decayed to one over e of its original life? After two lifetime times, it's going to be e power minus two, minus which is fifteen percent, five percent, three percent. So the lifetime essentially is the characteristic period, time period, which defines for me the rate at which molecules empty out the excited state. That's what it is. That's one reason as to why the lines will broaden. And that is what we call a natural problem, and other said it's also called a lifetime problem because it has to do with the lifetime. Also called a Heisenberg problem because it stems from the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. Step one. Let's look at one or two more. Then we will stop there. You won't push into many other problem mechanisms because it's enough if you know. But this, keep in mind, put it down somewhere. Probably have a problem on that. You know, if I give you a lifetime, what is the width you expect to see for that particular proposition? Tell me. which as far as the light is concerned is 
stationary, they are not even moving. If you are stationary, then you see the frequency, let's say, as mu. What will happen to those molecules which see that same frequency but they are moving towards the source? They will see it as a higher frequency. They will actually see this mu, not as mu, but they see it as mu plus delta mu. I think for the two prime. With respect to a reference frame that is fixed, the frequency is new, but the molecule is actually moving towards the source and therefore believes that this frequency is not new, it is actually Doppler shifted into mu prime. But mu prime is no good because I really, I really need mu to make this transition. And therefore, those set of molecules which are actually moving towards the source will not be able to use that frequency and make a transition. What will happen to those molecules moving away from the light? They don't see it as mu, they see it as mu minus delta mu. And let me call this as mu double prime, where mu double prime is lower than mu. When you have mu, you have mu prime and you have mu double prime. Stationary molecules, let's say, see this. The molecules moving towards the light source see this. The molecules moving away from the light source are seeing this. In other words, for the same frequency, because of the fact that the molecules are moving, you have a situation in which they all appear to be different frequencies for different people, which is essentially a consequence of the Doppler effect. If that happens, this fellow can make the transition, this fellow cannot. When do you think the slow can make a transition? 